OK, let's, oh, question? OK. OK, let's return to what we were looking at last time. And last time we had drawn and examined this circuit. And we had shown how this diode had to be on, because that's the only answer that made sense in terms of the conditions of the diode. Keeping in mind for a diode, we define VD from anode to cathode, then we define ID as flowing from anode to cathode. And the only answer that made sense is that this diode had to be on. And in this case, if we assumed ideal, then it was zero volts for an ideal diode, and ID was equal to 10 milliamps, which we knew because of KCL. This would have to be zero volts, and therefore that would be equal to 10 milliamps. And as we saw last time, somebody first said it was off. And I said, okay, let's check that. We found actually it couldn't be off, it had to be on. And this all comes into a kind of technique or way of thinking about these problems. You know, I can look at a circuit I've never seen before, and I cannot tell you quite often by inspection what the operating condition of the devices are in that circuit. So what do I do? I do what you guys are going to have to learn to do. You make an assumption and you check it. So I just want to kind of write these rules down. Ideal diode circuit analysis. If given a circuit with a diode, and for now we're going to assume the diodes are ideal, because that's how we're going to kind of learn how to use these and how to, how to apply this technique. This is what we're going to do. How do we determine How do we determine if the diode is on and off? How to, how to do that? What are we going to do? First, we can assume the diode is off. Or second, we can assume the diode is on. So we have one of two choices. It can't be both. It's got to be one or the other. So we start with one of those two assumptions. So if we assume the diode is off, therefore ID must be equal to zero. And then we calculate VD. And then we check. If the diode is off, VD has to be less than zero. So the diode must be off. Our assumption was correct. But if VD is greater than zero, in that case, the diode has to be on. It's got to be forward biased. So the diode's on. We have to now recalculate knowing that the diode was actually on. Over here, we can start and assume the diode is on. Therefore, VD must be equal to zero if the diode is on. And we're going to calculate ID. And just as we did here, let's look at that current. Is ID greater than zero? If the answer is yes, then the diode is on. On the other hand, if 
ID is a negative current. then in that case our assumption is incorrect. The diode must be off. And in both these cases, for this and for this, what we're going to do is we're going to recalculate the circuit values with the new assumption. Now we're going to be doing this not only with diodes this semester, we're going to be also doing this with transistors as well. Because as we're going to see, these components have multiple possible operating conditions. And we cannot just look at a circuit and know by inspection what they're going to be. Sometimes we can, but lots of times we cannot. And our, what we have to do is we have to make a reasonable guess, a reasonable assumption, check that assumption by looking at the boundary conditions. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're going to come back to this, and we're actually going to apply this methodology, this technique, to other circuits as we start looking at more interesting and more complex circuits. But we're always going to kind of come back to this idea. All right? And you'll all get good at this before this semester is over, because this is how you're going to have to solve problems. The answer never pops into your head. You have to check it. All right? Well, now that we have looked at a really simple circuit and we've looked at our analysis methodology, what I want to do now is start looking at applications of diodes. And we're, again, we're going to start with the ideal diode as our basis. So how do we apply the diode in various circuits? Let's look at one of the earliest circuits. This is actually one of the earliest applications of the diode back in the days of radio. And that was the application of a diode as a rectifier. So let's draw a simple little circuit here. So I've got a voltage source, V sub i, connected to a diode. And for now, we're going to assume that diode is ideal. And we're connecting it to a resistor. We're measuring the voltage across that resistor, VO. And I'm just adding a ground as a reference point because we're going to be dealing with these circuits nodally when we typically examine them. And in this case, VI, I'm going to assume, is a sinusoidal AC voltage source. All right. What I want to know is this. Given an ideal diode, given an input voltage, VI, and I'm just going to kind of sketch that. So I'm going to assume that VI has a magnitude of VP. So it's going to swing back and forth between values and plus and minus a VP. And then, of course, this is the time axis. So you guys have seen this before. You've looked at this. All right. Now, given this input, my question is, what does the output look like? All right. Well, in order to determine what VO looks like, we have to first determine over what portion of this VI, sometimes VI is positive, sometimes it's negative, over what portion of this input waveform is the diode on?
good question. All right. Now, in this problem, we're kind of going to kind of work it backwards to figure out how to solve this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to examine the circuit two ways. I'm going to look at it when the diode is on and look at it when the diode is off and see what the conditions are for VA to cause that to happen. So let's do a little simple circuit model. Some simple models, first of all. I'm first going to assume the diode is on. And if the diode is on, it's basically acting like a wire with a positive current flowing through it from anode to cathode. So I'm just going to replace that with a wire. So let's look at this circuit for a moment. If the diode's on and a positive current is flowing through that diode, what must be true about the polarity of VI for that to be happening? Circuit's one. What do we mean about VI? It must be it's positive, absolutely. VI must be positive. So if the diode's on, then VI is a positive input voltage. And that turns the diode on. So I just kind of worked it backwards to figure that out. Now let's look at another example. Let's assume the diode is off. So in this case, I know that VD must be less than zero. Well, let's look at this thing nodally. If I've got an open circuit, what is the voltage at that node, at the top of that resistor? What's it got to be? Zero, yeah, it's got to be zero volts, right? There's no current flowing through that resistor. It's an open circuit on the other end. There's no voltage drop across it. So I've got zero volts ground, I've got zero volts at the other end. So if this voltage is zero, over here, this is VI. That means I must have voltage VI at that node. So in order for the voltage across the diode to be less than zero, what must be true about VI? It's got to be less than zero. It's got to be negative. So I just did a little reverse logic here. I started with the assumption of what the diode condition must be, and I worked back to see what values or what polarities of VI would cause that to happen. Okay, therefore, what do I get? Well, I can kind of sketch it right on top of this. If I've got a voltage VI, which is a sinusoid, my output voltage is going to look like this. It's going to be the red waveform. When VI is negative, the output voltage is zero. When VI is positive, the output voltage is equal to VI. So that's what I get. I get half of the waveform. It chops off the bottom half. It chops off the negative half. This is an example of what we call half wave rectification.
Turns out rectification is an extremely useful property when you're building simple AM radios because it enables you to extract the audio signal from the radio carrier wave. So in the very early days of radio, that's why diodes were so important. But it also turns out halfway rectification is useful for a lot of other things, including, for example, transforming an AC voltage, for example, that comes out of the wall that Nashville Electric gives us, and transforming that into a DC voltage, which is going to be a steady, constant, unchanging value of voltage. So this is what NES gives us. This is what our electronics want. What we need to do that is to create a circuit called a power supply. And you may have heard that word many times. Well, that's what it is. A power supply is something that we take one type of voltage convert it to another type of voltage. And so you guys are actually in this class going to learn the fundamentals of how to build a simple power supply. In fact, you're going to construct a simple power supply in the lab and show it, prove to yourself that it works. That you can transform AC to DC. Yeah? Well, when the, well, when the diode is on, then the diode, this is an ideal diode. We're assuming this diode is simply a short circuit. So all the energy is being dissipated in the resistance. Okay, so current's flowing through the resistor. When the diode is off, then in effect we have a voltage source with no load. So no energy is being dissipated at all. And in this case, the power is equal to zero. The power balance is zero. Okay? I mean, in either case, whether the diode is on or off, power balance is always going to work. I'll have a positive power and a negative power when the diode is on. It balances to zero. In this case, all the powers are equal to zero. I mean, keep in mind, sources, voltage sources and current sources can have zero power. They don't have to have a load connected to them. All right? Questions? Well, that's a pretty cool trick. And in fact, we can do other cool things with this trick. What if I were to do this? What if I were to take that diode and flip it around? If I flipped that diode, what do you think the output voltage would wind up looking like? The part. We see the negative part, exactly. I can go through exactly the same chain of logic. And in this case, I can prove to myself that I'll see something like this. So in this case, I'll have minus VP appearing here plus VP. So in this case, if I flip the diode around, I can grab the bottom part of the waveform and pass that and cut off the positive end. So just by flipping a diode around, you can get some very different functionality. It depends upon do you want positive voltage out of your circuit, your rectifier, or do you want negative voltage out of your rectifier? All right. Questions? Well, this is a simple concept, and as I said, one of the earliest applications, but we can be more clever than this. Let, let's be more clever, right? That's what engineering is all about, being more clever. Let's take this diode idea, and I want to try to add another component to the circuit and see what happens. And by the way, I really wish I could flip these whiteboards around and reverse them like in other classrooms, but unfortunately I have to cover that one up whenever I'm writing on the other board, so my apologies.
Let's look at the following circuit. You guys recognize that schematic symbol I just wrote? Who recognizes it? Who doesn't? OK, a few of you don't know what that is. This represents a battery. You can think of it as a DC source, except of course it's a DC source that's not going to be variable. It's not going to be dependent. But you'll see this in schematics as a battery, a DC battery, the kind of thing you stick in your electronics. Yes? Oh, in this case, we're considering it ideal. Okay, but yes, in a real battery, they're going to be current limited. But here, I'm just going to say it's just a different way of drawing an ideal voltage source. Yeah, if you want to get into battery chemistry and battery performance, you need to take a course from Dr. Watulski, who's an expert in power electronics, and he can go into that all you know for the entire semester long. In fact, you know, figuring out how to maximize battery life is a whole other class that we're not even going to begin to touch in this course. I mean, part of what I'm trying to do in this class is not just to show you guys the fundamentals, but also to show you the much bigger picture of what's out there that you can learn. Because this is hopefully, for many of you, just the start of a journey in a career that's going to turn you into circuit design experts. So once again, I'm drawn the same circuit. I've got my ideal diode. And I've got my VI source, but now I have included a voltage. And notice the polarity of that battery. And in this case, I'm just considering it as if it's a DC voltage. All right? So VB is in series with VI. Now, what kind of behavior do I get out of the circuit? Well, I'm going to do exactly the same little trick that I did before. It's an ideal diode. In order to understand the parameters of how this thing's going to work, let's assume the diode's on. So if the diode's on, I'm going to do what I've done before. I'm going to draw the diode as if it were a wire. There's my output voltage VO. Notice I'm representing it as a nodal voltage. So here's VI, node voltage of VI. What's the voltage of that node? VI minus VB. And I know the current through the diode has to be greater than zero. Well, what's the only possible way that that current can be positive? What do I know about VI minus VB? It's got to be positive. So that's the only way I can have positive current flowing around that loop. And in which case, therefore, VI must be greater than VB in order for the diode to be on. And in this case, VO will be equal to VI minus VB when this happens. Because, of course, they're the same voltage. They're connected together by a wire. Same voltage. All right. So given this, let's consider, I said before, VI was a sinusoid of some sort. So I'm going to go ahead and write it that way. I'm going to say, OK, let's assume, let's let 
vi be equal to vp times cosine omega t. That should bring back memories from 2112, right? Except we're not going to do this with phasers. I'm going to think about this as a time varying waveform. So I'm representing this, okay? So what I'm saying is, if this is true, therefore VP times cosine omega t must be greater than VB in order for the diode to be on. Substituting VI into the equation I just did. And therefore, cosine omega t must be greater than VB over VP. So let's put some numbers into this. Let's assume that VB is equal to VP over 2. So the, the, the battery voltage is half of the magnitude of the AC waveform. So let's assume that's true. I'm just throwing some numbers in. And in that case, that means that cosine, if that's, if that's true, then VB over VP is equal to 1 half. And so therefore, this must be greater than 1 half. Cosine omega T must be greater than 0.5. Over what range of angles do we get? Well, it turns out this is true. Over a range of omega t being plus and minus 60 degrees. Although, of course, omega t is radians, and I wrote that in degrees. So, of course, you'd have to do the conversion. But you guys remember, this is, once again, just a simple trick, right? I'm just taking that arc cosine. So if I take the arc cosine of 0.5, what's the range of angles, okay? Between plus and minus 60 degrees. Okay, so from a unit circle point of view, What we're going to see is over this range. That's the range of angles over which we're going to see that cosine omega t is greater than 0.5. Amazing how much high school math is how that is still relevant, right? Even here in engineering. Can't get away from your high school math. Algebra, trig, all that stuff. Comes back. You need it again and again. Okay, so knowing this is true, what happens to VO? What happens to that voltage? Well, if we sketch it, we're going to see this. going to find is because we have that battery and the battery is equal to half of VP, the maximum voltage we'll ever see come out of the output is going to be VP over 2 because we're subtracting half of VP because of that battery being in series. So we're going to see this. If we had a standard half wave rectifier, I just want to kind of sketch this in. So for a standard rectifier, our phase angle, so we start at 0 degrees, we go to 90 degrees, it drops down, then at 270 degrees it turns on, and then at 450 degrees it turns off again, and then we're just going to keep going, adding 360 degrees over and over again. 
But with this new value for VO, instead I'm going to see this. I'm going to see this type of behavior. Because I'm subtracting VP over 2 from the voltage that's being generated by VI plus the half wave rectification taking place. And now we're going to find that we see this kind of behavior. It ends at 60 degrees and then this turns on at 300 degrees and then turns off at 420 degrees. So we find that the magnitude comes out and we also find the diode is on for a shorter and shorter portion of time. So with the original half wave rectifier the diode was on for 180 degrees of the input waveform. But now it's on for a much shorter portion whenever I set VP equal to. Now think about this. Let's assume I could now make this battery adjustable. I could vary the value of that battery voltage by turning a dial. As I turn that dial, what's going to happen to the peak value of this waveform? It's going to go up or down depending upon how high I turn it. If I make VB equal to VP, it'll never turn on because it can never get positive. And if I make VP equal to zero, or VB equal to zero, then it looks like my original half wave rectifier. So I can vary this by turning that knob. How long I have a voltage across that load. Does this remind you guys of anything? Something you have probably used all your life? I'm sorry? It's, well, pulse modulation is a way of doing this kind of trick, but what's an application of something like this? A dimmer, a light dimmer, right? Is that how they work? Well, that's how they used to work. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Nowadays, we use what's called pulse width modulation. It's almost a digital type of technique. But back when we had things called thyristors, and we all did this with the old incandescent light bulbs, we did it this way. So this is the, this is the way it was done but it's obsolete nowadays. Nowadays we do much more energy efficient ways of dimming bulbs, especially now that they're not incandescent bulbs, they're LED bulbs. So it used to be if you wanted to dim a bulb, you'd literally do this. You would do something that would literally adjust how long that voltage could be applied to the bulb, and then that would make the bulb bright or dim. Nowadays we do pulse width modulation. We just quickly turn the voltage on and off very quickly and how long it's on and how long it's off show, show, basically determines how bright the bulb is going to be. So I'm going to show you guys techniques that you know 40 or 50 years ago were commonplace. Nowadays with modern design they are not so commonplace but the concepts are the same. If you really wanted to learn how to do this nowadays once again you want to take a good course in power electronics from somebody like Professor Watulski who could tell you all about the techniques people use to do this stuff. So Again, it's the concept. Yes? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, perhaps duty cycle modulation? I don't know. I mean, it, it, this is a pretty obsolete technique. I'm sure there was some type of term people used for it back in the day, but um, I have no idea. I'll see if I can find out if there was a name for it. Okay, once again, I'll do a little investigating on that. But once again, back when we had the components called thyristors and stuff like that, we would use, and you'd actually turn those in your, on your, on you'd be turning a dial to adjust the, the duty cycle this way. But they were not efficient. They burned a lot of power, and that's why we don't use them anymore. Yeah? No, oh, I'm sorry. Well, this right here should be VI, okay? If we're talking about that voltage there, okay? But you're right. The output voltage itself, you're correct, is this voltage. Okay, I wasn't clear about that. So VI is this, VO is that. But once again, I'm not even showing the bottom half because I'm assuming the rectifier just cuts that off. All right? And incidentally, there's an example in the book. Look at example 4.1 in the text. It has an interesting variation on this concept where they're using different values, but you can see that they actually go through this in more detail. 
And so you might want to take a look at that in the text in your reading. Okay? So questions. And incidentally, we're going to come back to the rectifier. This is not the end of the rectifier. We'll be back because the rectifier is an incredibly useful device. And particularly when we start talking about power supplies, you're going to see this again. All right. Let's now look at some other interesting applications of diodes. Let's talk about switching and logic functions using diodes. And incidentally, if there are some of you in this room who have not had digital systems, don't worry about it. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the fundamentals of switching logic, but nothing that I can't teach you guys very quickly. So don't worry if you haven't had digital systems. Okay, let's consider switching and logic functions. And again, we're going to first look at this strictly in terms of ideal diodes. And one thing we're going to look at is a trick called current steering, which is really, when you think about it, a very simple idea given what you've already learned about the rectifier. Okay, once again, I'm throwing a schematic symbol at you guys you may not have seen before. Some of you may look at that and say, Dr. Holman, why is that inductor in a bubble? Well, it's not an inductor in a bubble. This is, once again, a schematic symbol that represents an incandescent lamp. So this represents the filament, right? The old Edison-style incandescent bulb, which basically is now obsolete nowadays in our modern era of fluorescent and LED lighting. So in this case, I'm going to assume I've got a couple of incandescent lamps. I, I could have also LED lamps and the like, but for now, we'll just say it's incandescent. And this is a red lamp. And this lamp turns on when I put 6 volts across it. This is a green lamp, and this turns on when it has 6 volts across it. So there are two different colored lamps that turn on when I apply a sufficient voltage. And I've got two diodes, D1 and D2, and both diodes are connected to some input voltage. And once again, notice the shorthand. I'm not actually drawing the input voltage source. It's implied that there is an input voltage source connected to the input here. And this input source is either going to be equal to plus 6 volts or minus 6 volts. It'd be one or the other. Or actually it could be zero as well. I could just turn it off completely. So how does the circuit work? First of all, I'm going to define my currents. ID2, anode to cathode, it must be flowing in that direction through D2. 
ID1 must be flowing in that direction, anode to cathode. So those currents have got to be positive if these are ideal diodes in order for those diodes to be turned on. Okay, so in this case, let's consider what happens if Vn is plus 6 and minus 6 volts. So if Vn is equal to plus 6 volts, if a lamp is on, it's going to basically behave like a resistor. Current's going to flow through it. It's going to heat up. That's what they do. So you can think of these lamps as being resist equivalent resistors. So if Vn is positive and these two diodes are ideal, is it possible for one of those two diodes to be on? Yeah. Which one is going to be on? It's got to be D2, right? Because if that's a positive voltage, positive currents got to be flowing out of that voltage source if it's going to be supplying power to the rest of the circuit. 2112. Well, the only way this can be a positive current is if it goes through D2. So in this case, D2 is on. since ID2 is greater than zero. And since D2 is on and it's ideal and it's got six volts across it, that means I've got six volts across that lamp. And therefore the green lamp turns on. What about D1? Is D1 on or off? Got to be off. There's no way current can flow this direction into that input source. So in this case, D2, or rather I should say D1, is off. If there's no current flowing through the lamp, that's zero volts. I've got six volts here. What's the voltage across VD1? Zero minus six is minus six volts. which of course is less than zero. Is that diode off? Yeah, it's off. So it's reverse biased. All right. So that's what I get if the input voltage is positive. What if Vn is negative? Okay, what's going to happen now? Everything reverses. In this case, the current now has to be flowing that direction into a negative voltage. That's minus 6 volts. So in this case, I can now have ID1 flowing in this direction. Therefore, D1 is on. And D2 is off. And therefore, the red lamp is on. So in this case, I'm just using exactly the same logic I did before. I'm just reversing my logic. And in this case, that's now minus 6 volts. And I've got 0 volts across D1. And now the red lamp's on. Current's flowing this way from ground into the negative voltage. So you got to keep your 2112, your circuits one in mind when you're looking at this kind of stuff, right? You have to think about voltage polarities and current directions as you learned them back in circuits one. Okay. And of course, if Vn is equal to zero, what happens if Vn is equal to zero? What's the condition of the two lamps? They're both off. There, there are no voltages in the circuit. There are no currents in the circuit. So if Vn is equal to zero, then ID1 and ID2 are both equal to zero, and therefore both lamps are off.
Can you think of an application for a circuit like this? Flashing light. Well, flashing light is a possibility. Let's think back 100 years ago when uh, we just started having lots of automobiles on the road. Red, green, stoplight, right? <laughs> How do you do a stoplight? Well, actually you can do a stoplight by simply flipping the polarity of the voltage going to the stoplight without actually having to do any switching in the light itself. Just have the wires running over to the stoplight and just flip the polarity of the voltage and boom, one or the other turns on. So this is a possible way of doing a stop. I'm not saying it's the only way you could have done it, okay? But I'm just saying this is a way you can do it. So here we're steering the current. Depending upon the polar the, how the uh, diode is installed in the circuit, we can either cause a positive or a negative current to flow through different branches depending upon the polarity of the voltage. So like I said, this is very much like the rectifier idea. Yeah? Well, if VN is negative, okay, if VN is negative, that means if current's going to flow, it's got to flow from ground into the negative voltage. All right, that's why. And so, therefore, it's got to go in this direction, and therefore, the diode's going to be on. So, once again, with positive voltage, the current's going to flow out. Negative voltage, the current's going to flow in. Okay, so that's one kind of obvious application. What are other applications? Well, let's look at this. Let's consider simple logic functions. All right, let's look at this. I've got two input voltages, VA and VB. And once again, I'm not showing what those input sources are. They're implied, but I've got two input voltages. And I've got an output voltage, VY. And incidentally, this is the convention you'll often see, often see in these schematics. The stuff here on the left side, those are input voltages. They're sources. VY, however, there's no assumption of a source connected to there. That's simply the node voltage at that node. And you'll say, well, how do you tell them apart? Experience. That's really what it comes down to. But you'll see them drawn like this, and just like everybody who, you know, all, any experienced circuit designer will look at this and say, oh yeah, those are sources. There's something supplying those. Oh yeah, that's just the voltage across that node. That's all that is. Okay, so in this case, I've got a resistor and VA and VB. VA and BV can have two possible values, 0 volts and 5 volts. Not the same value necessarily, but those are the only two possible values they can have. And it turns out that doing this, having a two-value voltage, one or the other value, turns out we can think about this in terms of Boolean logic. I'll say that 0 volts is logic 0, and 5 volts is logic 1, or it's Boolean 0, Boolean 1. And now, if you've had digital systems, this is nothing new. You guys know this. But some of you may not have had that. So we're just kind of going back to, hopefully, you remember a little bit about Boolean logic. You were exposed to it at some point, doing math with base 2. OK, so I'm going to call this diode DA. I'm going to call this DB. 
And I want to know how this circuit works. Let's think about this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a table here. I've got two input voltages, each with two possible values. That means there's four possible combinations. So I can have VA and VB equals 0, 0, 0, 5, 5, 0, 5, 5. What I want to know is, what's the value of VY? OK. Let's look at the easy one first. Both the input voltages are zero volts. There are no voltages in the circuit. Therefore, there are no currents in the circuit. So in this case, what's the condition of both diodes? They're both off, yeah. They're obviously both off. What is Vy equal to? Well, if there's no current flowing through this resistor, then Vy must simply be equal to zero, right? Now let's consider if VA is 0 and VB is equal to 5 volts. Well, if we think about this for a moment, if VB is 5 volts, this cannot be 0, because if it is, that diode is going to be forward biased very strongly. In fact, what we'll find is the answer that makes sense is if VB is equal to 5, and VA is equal to zero is for DB to be on. We have zero volts, we have five volts, and we have positive current flowing through the diode through that resistor. So in this case, DB is on. What about DA? Well, I've got zero volts here. I've got five volts on this side. What's the voltage across that diode? What is VD for that diode? 0 minus 5 minus 5. It's negative, right? That diode's got to be off. What is the output voltage? 5 volts. What if I flip it around and make it 5 and 0? So now that's 5 volts, that's 0. What happens now? Now just the states of the diodes flip around. In this case, DA is on, DB is off. And once again, I've got 5 volts. What if they're both 5 volts? In this case, they're both on. In this case, positive current can flow through both and through the load. And again, I've got 5 volts. OK, so I did this little table. Now I'm going to do this the way we do it in digital logic. A, B, Y. Here's what we call a truth table. Let's represent this with Boolean algebra. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. What kind of logic gate or logic function is that? OK, this is an OR. Correct. We'd represent it like so. In fact, it is a two-input OR function, or two-input OR gate. And for those of you who, of course, have had digital systems, you have seen this before, but this is just a standard Boolean mathematical function, and we represented it with that type of gate. Now, just want to point this out. There's nothing that prevents me from adding more diodes to this.
I could add two more diodes like so to this circuit. What kind of circuit would I have then? Four, four input OR, right? Now it's going to be four input OR. So I can have as many OR inputs as I want to to that circuit. And just adding the extra diodes and the extra inputs, I can build this as far as I want. Yes? So the diodes prevent uh, other signals from coming back into the control In effect, yes. In other words, well, what the diode does is, in this case, the diode is off and it's going to prevent current from flowing back in the other direction into that other input source. It blocks it. That's what we're going out doing here. But this is a simple Boolean logic function. And those of you who have had digital circuits have seen this before. Well, I can take this same idea and I can do this. What if I do this? So in this case, I'm connecting the resistor to plus 5 volts instead of to ground, and I'm flipping around the directions of the diodes. So this looks very similar to what I just did there, just flipping around the diode directions and changing what I connect the resistor to. So once again, VA and VB can be either 0 or 5 volts. So again, Going to construct my little table. Four possible combinations of input voltages for VA and VB. So looking at this this time, Okay, if the current is zero through the resistor, if there's no current flowing through the resistor, what's VY going to be? Five volts. Okay, so it's going to be five volts unless one of those diodes is turned on. So in this case, let's assume that VA and VB are both zero. Well, if they're both zero, then current can flow through both of those diodes if they're both on and go through this resistor and flow out. So in this case, if these are both equal to zero volts, those diodes can both be on. And in this case, Vy will be equal to zero volts. And I'm going to have current flowing through the resistor and flowing through those two diodes, splits between both diodes. So in this case, DA and DB are both on. And VY is equal to zero. Okay, now let's assume that one of these is five volts. So now let's assume that VB is five volts. Well, if VB is five volts, there is still a path for current to flow. DA can still be on. Current's going to flow through this. This will be zero volts for Vy. And now dB is reverse biased. It's zero to five. V, and for this diode, anode to cathode is less than zero. So in this case, 
dA is going to be on, dB is going to be off, but again, VY is equal to zero. Or I can flip it around. I'll make that five volts. I'll make that zero volts. So now in this case, the bottom diode is going to be on. Now current can flow through dB. I've got minus five volts across dA, so you can easily prove to yourself that I must have this condition, off then on. But again, VY is equal to zero volts. So regardless of whether one diode or the other is on, I've got a path for current to flow and therefore VY is zero. Unless both are five volts. If this is five volts, this is five volts, and that's five volts. If I've got five volts at all of these nodes, what is the only value of current there can be if I've got the same potential at both ends? Got to be zero, right? Current can't flow unless there's a, a place for it. There's got to be a potential drop, right, in order for that to happen. In this case, it's the same as if all the voltages were zero. In this case, they're all five, but I've still got the same thing. There's no, there's no potential. There's no voltage drop across this resistor. And so in this case, what I get is both the diodes are now off. But if that's the case, then the current through the resistor is zero, and therefore Vy is five volts. And again, I'm going to go through and draw my little truth table. What is that? It's an AND gate. So in this case, I've got an AND gate. And of course, you know, and from a Boolean point of view, I'd represent this as A equal A dot B. And up here, this would be, or y, pardon me, Y equal A dot B. And this would be I, Y equal A plus B for the OR gate. Once again, Boolean logic. And again, like I did before, if I wanted to, I can add more diodes. And I can have a three or four or five input AND gate. OK. Now this is a really interesting result. I can actually do digital logic using nothing but resistors and diodes makes you kind of wonder, why didn't we have computer circuits being built around the beginning of the 20th century? What is missing from this? The voltage drop across the diode? No, no, no. I, you could still build this even if there was a voltage drop across the diode. You could still build ANDs and OR gates. What is missing that prevents me from building computers? Yes? Inverter. There's no inverter. There, there's no inversion, okay? If you want to create a, what would they call a canonical logic family, you've got to be able to invert a one to a zero and a zero to a one. If there were a way to do this with diodes and resistors, we would literally have had computers 30 or 40 years before we had them. But we had to wait until we had working vacuum tubes and we could use those as switching devices. But diodes are, themselves won't work. Now, it doesn't mean you can't use the ANDs and the ORs, because people did use these for switching functions. ANDs and OR functions are very useful. But if we could have only figured out the NOT function, then it would have been a revolution. But unfortunately, you can't make that happen just with diodes and just with resistors. So a little bit of history for everybody. OK? Questions about this?
All right. And then notice, you'll note, note, guys, I did a little bit of hand waving here, right? I didn't try to actually go through explicitly and solve for every possible combination with the voltages and the currents through them. But you can always check those assumptions yourselves. So I just, I kind of hurried this along to make things a little bit quicker. All right. So another inter another interesting application of diodes: logic functions. Now let's look at a more interesting circuit. And of course, when the professor says interesting, that means harder, right? What is that? Let's look at another interesting circuit. And when the professor says this is a really interesting circuit, that means it's really hard, right? We all, we all know that. Okay, so hopefully I've got you guys all thinking the right way, okay? How to think about these circuits. And once again, we're, we're still going to approach these things from the viewpoint of them being ideal diodes for now. Now I'm just kind of filling in for this particular circuit, just filling in all the different values. Okay. Now notice this node is going to a plus 10 volt power supply or voltage. That's going to a minus 10 volt at the bottom. So once again, notice the convention. I'm not actually drawing those voltages, but that's assumed that we've got plus and minus 10 volts. All right, so this is actually an example from the book. We want to find the value of I0 and V0 for this circuit. All right. How do we do this? Okay. Well, we look at this and we'll say, oh, well, when I'm, when I'm as wise as my professor and I have learned all the stuff that he is trying to teach me, this will all be obvious and I will know exactly what state of those diodes are in. And I will tell you guys right off the bat, I have no clue what state those diodes are in just by looking at that circuit. I have no idea. I can't look at that and magically know what state they're in. But we've got to figure that out because we can't solve for the circuit unless we know the state. So here we're going to go back to that analysis methodology we talked about before. How do we figure out the state of this circuit? Well, how many possible combinations would we need to examine in order to figure this out? How many? Four. Yeah, right. I've got two diodes. Two diodes can be either on or off. This is just like the Boolean logic example we just looked at. So either D1 is on, D2 off, D1 off, D2 on, both are off, both are on. How do we know which is which? We make a guess and we figure, see if we can figure it out. All right? So in this case, we're going to make an assumption and then we're going to solve and we're going to see if we violate the boundary conditions that we know that ideal diodes have to follow. All right? So next time we'll come back to this problem. And we will see how to apply our assumption, make an assumption, check the assumption technique. See you guys next week. Remember, lab starts on Monday. Check the lab assignments.